a lifestyle. Sports cards and we live now. Jeremy Lee in the building and every guest that you ever needed. Sports cards after hours keep the hobby heated. Updates hobby talk like you never seen it. Sports cards live and nothing could ever beat it. Sports cards is a lifestyle. Sports cards and we live now. Welcome to another episode of Sports Cards Live with your host, Jeremy Lee. All right, what is going on, everybody? Welcome to a new type of content on Sports Cards Live, the podcast accelerator. This is the first time we are trying this. We'll see how it goes, but I'm excited to bring Ryan Seaver on with me tonight. It's also a, a surprise live here, Ryan, on the Sports Cards Live channel. Did uh, no promotion. We have uh, one person watching us right now. Let's see if anyone else joins. But again, there's been no publicity about this. We're going to see how it goes, and then it will live on on the channel and in podcast form. Of Ryan, very quickly, how are you? I'm doing great, Jeremy. Thanks for having me, and excited to try something new here with you. And you know, let's see how it goes. Let's have some fun. Yeah, ex exactly. We're trying something new. I kind of like being discreet and and not publicizing this. I've really told nobody that I was doing this except for you, and I'm excited to uh, to do it and, and give it a shot. We do have a few people who've joined us live, so everybody, welcome, and please bear with us. Uh, the reason we're doing this and the, the, the really the impetus behind this podcast accelerator is that uh, I met Ryan at the National, and he approached me, and um, he showed me the book that he had written, which is called Cardboard Profit. He gifted me a copy, which I read the first couple of chapters. And then we got together and we we just had a chat, a Zoom chat. And as we were talking, it came it came up that you know he, Ryan would would like to start doing a podcast himself and elevate his elevate his platform, his presence in the hobby. And I thought, well, the podcast is a great way to do that. A lot of people are doing it. So we started talking, and it just kind of dawned on me that you know I've done well, I've over 440 now live streams, uh, lots of podcasts out there on the various platforms. And it dawned on me that, you know, maybe I can help Ryan. Maybe I can help talk through it. And, and even in that discussion, Ryan, you know, you were asking me for advice. I gave you a whole bunch of like my tips and tricks and sort of things to keep in mind when you're going to do a podcast. And I thought, well, maybe we should, maybe we should just like live stream this discussion and, and, and help inspire other want to be content creators to actually just get out there and start to do it and in being you know aligned with that here we are starting something new myself for for my content which is really reflecting what i'm trying to help you do ryan so with all that why don't you uh just set the stage a little bit and tell us a, a little about you know your yourself your hobby history and really why do you want to start a podcast and create content for the sports card world. Yeah, I appreciate that, Jeremy. I, um, my name is Ryan Seaver. My brand is called Cardboard Profit. I have written a book. It's on the Amazon bestseller list right now within the very niche category of antiques and collectibles, sports cards, of course, but pretty cool to see that um, have some early success. I'm on Instagram at Cardboard Profit, trying to put some helpful tips out into the world, but I've been collecting for 30 plus years now um, at 16 or so years ago. Now I started doing cards as a business in some capacity anyway, or looking at it from more of the money making side of, of uh, sports cards. So when I look at what is out there from an education standpoint, and when you look back at what happened over the past few years, when you look at like the wave of new folks that came in during the pandemic, a lot of bad advice was getting thrown around by people who maybe didn't have their those new folks best interests in mind and that's a shame because those folks bought stuff that didn't make sense you know we're buying third year base cards of random players for hundreds of dollars as psa 10s it's like that just has never made sense in the history of sports cards and suddenly we're going to start doing that those people are going to get burned so I, you know how can and guess what that's exactly what happened a lot of those people left the market so I look at that as a, a, a real shame that we didn't do a better job collectively for those of us that do have a foundation in sports cards to help educate and empower those folks to kind of just find their footing. And so now that Fanatics is taking over and with the kind of projected suspected growth that's coming over the next few years, I decided that I'm going to just at least take a shot at going out there and trying to help those folks to just, again, find their footing and and get the foundation that helps them be more self-sufficient so they don't have to go and ask people who are you buying and what you know and rely on someone else they can be empowered to do that for themselves 
Right on. So in, in, in your desire to help people, you know, there's only so many ways that you can get it. You've, you've already written the book. And as you mentioned, you can buy this on Amazon, Cardboard Profit by Ryan Seaver there. That's him right there. Um, and but there's, you know, as we discussed, there's many other ways to get your message out there. You can you can go live on YouTube. You can do pre-recorded videos. You can you can do audio podcasts. You can do more and more posting on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. You can do short reels on on TikTok, on YouTube, post them up to Twitter as well. There's all sorts of things that you can do to get your message out there if you want. And I want to kind of help encourage you, Ryan, to, to get started because that's the one thing that I think a lot of wannabe content creators, they've got ideas, they just don't start. And I think a lot of, I think one of the main reasons people just don't start their own content, their own podcast or whatever is because they want to be good at it. They want to, they just want to get it right from the beginning. They're afraid that they might embarrass themselves or that they might slip up or that the production quality won't be good enough. And they're watching other content creators who may have bigger audiences already. And they're concerned that they're not going to be able to build an audience and that people will compare them to a higher production value channel or podcast out there. And what I say to you, Ryan, and everybody else is don't worry about any of that. That's just noise. You know, you have to simply start. And I'm trying to set the example by starting this new series. We'll see how many episodes I do of the podcast accelerator, but I want to accelerate your content, Ryan, and other other wannabe content creators through this new series of episodes that we're going to do here. So sounds like you've got you've got a lot to say. You do have a lot to say. I mean, you've said, look, I mean, this book is chock filled with your experience and kind of advice and, and approaches that you're giving. But let me ask you this. Why haven't you started your podcast yet? I've kind of given my thoughts as to why people don't start. But yourself, Ryan, why haven't you started yet? Yeah, it's a good question and very fair. Um, I It's daunting to be entirely transparent. I think you hit on a lot of the the, the fear and um, uncertainty and doubt that, that goes through your mind is who's going to listen to this when there's all these other options, there's better production quality, there's more established people out there that have already built their audience. And so I, I tried to focus on just letting the book kind of settle in a little bit. I, I released it in late May, so um, it's only been out a few months. Trying to build up a following a bit on Instagram, putting one post up per day that's hopefully some kind of helpful content. You know, I don't know everything. Like, I'm not going to try to be the guy that knows that's the foremost expert. I'm not necessarily special. I've just been here in this market for a long time, like many of the folks that are probably watching this. So... I think that when you look at the next evolution of it, though, there are so many different directions you can go. You know, do I build up a website? Do I try to do some kind of subscription content or a, a newsletter? Or, you know, do I get on more platforms? Do I start a podcast? And that's been one of the things that I've struggled with is there are so many directions you can go, which is going to help you reach the most people and get the message out to the folks that are that are really looking for it. You mentioned subscription-based content, whether it's a newsletter or there's a lot of content creators in our space and others that are putting out a subscription-based or a premium content that you have to pay whatever, a couple bucks a month for, five bucks a month, 10 bucks a month. I've never done that. Has the idea crossed my mind? Sure, only because it's I, I've seen other people do it. Have I ever considered it seriously? Not even close. I've never once thought about doing that Ryan, and I don't, it's not something that I recommend in our space that people put out that, that paid for content. I think that, um, I think there's a lot, I think you can gain a lot more traction and I think that you can gain a lot more uh, followers, listeners, viewers, if you are just providing your expertise uh, for free and then finding other ways. If you, if monetizing your content is something you want to do, uh, then I think there's other ways to do that besides the subscription-based content. However, I, you know, that's for me, I wouldn't do it, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't say not to do it, but I would caution you that in our space, there are people who kind of frown upon that and they will, they may come after you uh, or anybody else who does that premium paid for content. So, you know, if you're asking my advice, I would say uh, steer away from that. Provide your provide your content 
uh, for free on podcast, YouTube, wherever else. And eventually you will find other ways. I believe if you are now, if you follow my, my uh, basic guidelines for hobby content, which I'm going to, I'm going to share right now. The, the Jeremy Lee guidelines for hobby content are that you want to go into every episode, every podcast, every live stream, every recorded video. You want to go out there with, with three things in mind. You want to be entertaining. You want to be inspiring and you want to be educating. If you can, if you can provide your audience with something inspiring, you can give them some new information. So it's something that's educational and you can entertain them, then I think you've got a great recipe for a successful podcast. And then there's the then there's three more things that you need to, to have at your disposal to further uh, give, give you the ability or, or the really a better chance of being a successful podcast or, or content creator. And that is you have to be authentic. You, you just you have to be authentic. You have to be passionate about about what you're talking about, and you have to have expertise. You have to have subject matter expertise. You have to know what you're talking about. If you have expertise, passion, and authenticity, and you deliver your content with to entertain, to inspire, and to educate, I don't know how you can go wrong in the hobby content world, and probably in any content, any area of hobby content. So let's go through those things in terms of you, Ryan. Um, so educating you, you've already shown that you can educate by writing a book. Like the guy, this guy wrote a book and it's out there. And, um, I've, I've read the first few chapters of this book. Now it's not for the, I don't believe it's for the, the, the advanced hobbyist, Ryan, I don't want to, I don't want to take away any, you know, uh, success you might have with this book, but I think that this book is great for people who want to learn about how you're thinking about things and, you know, it, the subtitle is the strategic playbook for making money with sports cards. Now, now let's be honest, that right there might rub a few people the wrong way, but that's okay. Everything isn't for everybody. And you've got your ideas, you've put pen to paper, and you've produced the book and, it, and it's out there now. So you definitely cover the educate requirement for me, then there's inspiring. I mean, people always want to be inspired to make money. So I, I think that that you can do that. But to do that, you're gonna to have to show that you've got examples of where it's worked for you. So let me just ask you that. Can you can you sort of back up your content with with real life examples where you've succeeded at generating profit from car, from sports cards? Yeah, I can and I think you'll as you continue through the book there's more examples of that that I lay out pretty clearly and that's one of the things that I'm going to start doing a little bit more on my Instagram. I did one the other day that laid out a specific example of buying something that the market hadn't quite adjusted to a player who was playing very, very well, but because certain cards, you know, better key rookie cards of that player hadn't really sold for a while, comps suggested that the market was like still lower than what it really was if you were paying attention. So I shared an example of how I was able to use that to basically buy something and then trade it for a higher value less than a week later. Um, but so that just as one example that comes to mind recently, but yeah, I think you're spot on that there's one element that I've learned very quickly is important to this is I, I started off with a random placeholder logo on my Instagram page. And very quickly, I learned from every single person that's been successful in this as a content creator is you, you got to be a person, you got to be your brand. And um, you'll see now I've got my little, my own face on there. It made me cringe to make that graphic because I don't necessarily want to be card famous or whatever, it, you know, if, if my content were to take off, but I think it kind of comes with the territory there. So, um, I, but I think just giving real life examples and giving people something that they can actually see in, in action instead of the theoretical thought process behind it is definitely something that needs to be a, a bigger part of it than at least on my Instagram, what I've done so far. So working yeah. to check that box a little bit more thoroughly. Yeah, we see a lot of content on Instagram where people are sharing thoughts and ideas and they're putting up graphs and charts, but they're not necessarily like these graphs and charts aren't necessarily reflecting their own activity. They're just sharing ideas, which is a, a great thing. Like, thank you to all those people for doing that. But if you could then 
blend in, you know, these are my own experiences. I bought this for that and sold it for, for, uh, for that plus or minus a percentage that's going to, I think, resonate with people. So you've got the educate piece down. I think you can, I think you have the inspire piece down and then there's the entertaining piece. People do want to be entertained. If they're going to sit there and watch you on video or listen to your podcast, if you, you know, if you speak without passion, you might not retain the viewer or the listener. So let's talk about, about that for a second. The entertainment perspective. Do you, do you feel that the entertaining aspect is, is as important as educate and inspire? And do you feel like you have what it takes from a either verbal or like, sorry, either audio or audio and video perspective to entertain people? And, and yeah, let me just let me just ask you that. Are you are you comfortable with the entertainment? Because to me, you need to be entertaining in order to have successful content. Thoughts on that from you? Yeah, I think that's for other people to decide. I think I can put out there what what I think would be entertaining potentially. But I, I also think that when you look at the gap that I'm trying to fill, it is that education gap. Like I, I, I think that that's one piece of content creation in the sports card world that just isn't being hit on right now very well. And so hopefully if I can hit on that effectively enough, that'll almost by default take care of some of the entertainment just through the way that we're gonna talk about sports cards and the various ways of making money or whether it's you know trying to find a better deal on a PC card or whatever it may be like that'll bring some entertainment value in and of itself because we're all, you know, we're all hobby enthusiasts to begin with. Otherwise we wouldn't be on this show or, or listening to this show. Um, so I think that the, the topic itself will help with that piece. And then people can decide whether they love me or think I'm garbage and want to punch me in the face. That's totally <laughs> fine too. So, you know, I'm not for everyone necessarily, but I, I can, I'm happy to just give it a shot and, and see what people think. So, well, let, let me give you a, let me give you a bit of a tip or a hint or, I think something that is factual. If you are passionate about the subject matter, I think that that you will be entertaining by default. You know, because if you're passionate, yeah. you're probably not going to talk monotone. You're probably going to, you know, inflect certain words that make you more excited about things. So, if you are passionate for your subject matter, if you are passionate about your content, I think the entertain the the requirement to be entertaining in your content will naturally flow therefrom. So we've covered educate, we've covered inspire, we've covered entertain, we've covered passion, because I mean, you wrote a book, you're obviously passionate, like you spent time doing that. So that's a wonderful thing. Authenticity, getting to know you, I met you in person at the National, we had a nice conversation, you, you gave me a copy of your book, and I was grateful for that. And I thought it was really cool. And to be honest, I'd never heard of Ryan Seaver, I'd never heard of the book Cardboard Profit. So kudos to you for going to the National and meeting people, myself and others, I'm sure, and giving away a few copies of your book to help get yourself, uh, you know, more, uh, help elevate your, your own personal platform. So I think the authenticity, I feel like you're authentic, Brian. I also feel like you're not a content creator or a hobbyist who is looking to make profit from cardboard that is also looking to, uh, to mislead anybody. You're not, I don't, get that from you. You seem like you seem like a genuine person. You seem like a nice guy. And I mean, hey, I've read people wrong before. Maybe I'm reading you wrong. I don't think so though. Uh so I think the I think you are authentic. I like that about you. And I think that that's going to help you when you do start your own podcast or uh video YouTube channel. I think that's going to help you gain uh viewers, followers, fans if you will. So that's a good thing. And then the, the last the last one is expertise, subject matter expertise. You have the experience. So I think you, I think you, you cover my six main kind of the, the ingredients for a successful, for successful content. And I don't kind of, I don't toss these things out there lightly. I've thought about them uh, extensively over my three and a half years of being a content creator in the sports card space. And I do believe that that is the recipe for success. So if you can follow my little recipe, uh, I think I think you'll be fine. The other one that I didn't mention is consistency. You know, you can't just drop a podcast, you know, once a month. Well, you can, but if you're going to drop a podcast once a month, make sure you drop a podcast once a month. 
Don't drop one in January and then take six months off and come back in July and then do one in August and then wait till next January again. I think consistency is important so that people remember you and you, you remain top of mind. Also, Ryan, as you know, there's a lot of content out there. I believe that there is still room for more quality content. And by quality, I come back to educational, inspiring, entertaining, comes with passion, authenticity, and expertise. So uh, that's, and that's the kind of content creator that I want to work with on this series of episodes, this podcast accelerator series, are people that that I would listen to and that I would watch. And uh, I think you're one of those people. Uh, let's go to a couple comments before you respond. And sorry to everybody, we've got, we've got for an episode that is in the middle of the afternoon, totally unannounced, we got 20 people with us right now. Eric Stefano, thank you for being here. Stukes, happy to happy to have you during the day, Stukes. I got to meet meet Stukes at the at the national as well. Hockey Barn says, fear and shyness of being in front of a, I think he means camera, would be my great hurdle to do viewable content. Yeah, that's definitely something that you have to overcome and be comfortable with. And as far as I know, this might be Ryan's first uh first time on a on a live podcast, Ryan. Is that true? On a live podcast, yes. I've done one recorded one so far. So this, go for it. You got to put yourself out there and give it a shot, right? You you have to just start. And it's funny because this is this is where I, I feel like I'm walking the walk. And what I mean by that is before we went live today, I said to Ryan, I said, well, let's just do this and see what happens. I don't know what to expect. I don't have a, a great format developed for this yet. I do have a bit of an outline, but you know, let's start. Let's show that you can just start now. I, I have an advantage in that I have an established channel and I have an audience and followers and subscribers. But still, I'm I'm out of my comfort zone right now, Ryan. I don't I've never done this type of content before. So just start, just do it. That's that's the key. Eric agrees with Hockey Barnes comment. Greg C says transparent and the stuff that works, and then what doesn't work. That's a great point. I think we get tons of content today that only shows the wins. We need both sides of the coin. This is uh, Greg C. I want to thank you for being here and for that comment because I didn't think of this yet. But for what Ryan wants to do, Ryan, I think you need to really remember this piece. I think you probably will because you're not. I don't think you're looking to paint a a picture where everything is just roses and sunshine. There are there are losses to be had in this in this in the sports card world. People are losing money all the time on cards. But hopefully you're going to make more money than you lose if that's what you're trying to do. So I think you need to almost like, you know, take a mental image of this comment and remember, I think it's a crucially important, Ryan, for your credibility and your ability to build your content platform as we move forward. What do you think? Do you agree? Yeah, well, I was excited to see that comment come in in the first place. Uh because I think that that hits the nail on the head. There's so many people out there putting out, here's how much money I made. And I'm, you know, I made $800,000 flipping sports cards. Yeah, but how did you do that when the market dropped by what it dropped by over the past few years? Like, if you were really involved in 2020 and 2021, I'm sorry, but I, I just struggle to believe that. I think there are very few people that truly made enormous money and didn't get hit by the, the backswing when the market fell back down. And I, who cares? Like, that's part of it. That's reality, right? And that's, I think that's part of being human. And, you know, you're going to make mistakes. I got slapped on some of my things that I thought were great investments in 2021. I thought, okay, the market's dipped a little bit. It's going to bounce right back just because it, you know, it grew immensely for eight consecutive months or whatever. Nope, it, it kept falling. And I took some L's on that stuff. And I think that sharing that is almost more valuable. Like, it's one of the things I think I touched on in my book fairly early on is like, this is really not, it's, there's no perfect recipe for making money with sports cards. It's just, I don't have like the perfect formula. There are other approaches to this. Some people do this better than I do, quite frankly, or on a wider scale, but for the most part, here's what's worked for me. And it comes from, you know, 16 some odd years of learnings and you don't learn as much from the wins as you do from the losses. So. It's basically, if I can help shorten that learning curve for someone out there that's newer and help them maybe maybe avoid that mistake that I made 12 years ago, because I can just share that experience with them firsthand, that's, that's what I'm trying to do is just to help that person get started and build that foundation without having to go through the, the L's that I've taken over the years as well. 
You know, the other thing about Greg's comment here, which we're leaving on, because I think this is the most important, uh, might be the most important bit of information in this whole show. Greg could Greg could co-host this with yeah. me right now, is that by sharing the L's and the unsuccessful plays that you make in, in your quest to, to generate the title of your book, which is Cardboard Profit, by sharing the losses, that's how that's how you really develop it and 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 uh, prove your authenticity because you're sh not every it's not only wins by showing the losses, people will understand this guy is authentic. He's not pretending it's all everything's wonderful all the time. And I think that's that's really really important. I've learned that firsthand in my content and watching other people's content. That if you know people will see right through it. If you just think that everything's always wonderful in the hobby. Uh, it's not gonna fly with with the, with with the critical thinkers out there, which of which there are many. Uh, Eric Stefano says, "I already like this guy." That's hey, I liked him as soon as I met him. I, I, like honestly, uh, Ryan just seems like a really good guy who I'd probably just be friends with outside of the hobby. Loud Collector is happy to have a a daytime SEL. Good to see you, buddy. And Hockey Cardboard says, "Many people are being slapped by the Wander Franco hype train this week." Yeah. That's an important thing. Actually, I'm doing an episode tonight of taking stock with a DPZ with Dennis Zender. And our topic is really titled off field shenanigans and how they how do they impact the hobby? So we're going to be talking about, you know, Wander and many other uh, examples of that later tonight. But thank you, HKY Cardboard, for joining us. Um, you know, that's a that's an interesting. Let me ask you in your book. Do you cover the 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 reality that some athletes who we may be invested in, we may be, you know, collecting in, they can do some, they can do some stupid things or be accused of doing some stupid things that can impact their values and have an impact on your overall uh, goals within achieving your goals in the hobby. Did you consider, do you consider those sorts of things? I do. And, and I actually had, there's an example in the book where it compares it's basically like if you had invested in a Zion Williamson silver prism or a, or a, uh, a Jokic silver prism going into like a season ago, um, you know, what, what would have happened and what should you do and whatnot. But uh, that originally was actually John Morant and Zion Williamson. And be right before I published the book, job had the two incidents with the guns. And I'm like, man, I, this is like, this is going to send the wrong message because this is no longer a good example. People are going to have that, that, that gun thing in their head and, and it's going to ruin the point that I'm trying to make. So I actually had to swap him out of that and put Jokic in there instead, which honestly is probably a better example anyway of what I was trying to uh, convey. But so that's definitely a big part of it and, and something that it's, it's hard to judge character from afar and when we're only looking at box scores sometimes, but it's definitely a real piece to this. I don't know who could have predicted the wander situation that we're in. Like, what a bizarre scenario to have to find yourself in if you're invested in his cards. So, yeah, lots of lots of it, lots of issues there. We'll talk about that on a, a whole different uh, show. Taking stock tonight here on Sports Cards Live and the Sports Card Dad Network, Network with Dennis. All right, let's let's uh, let's get into a few other things. We're going we're gonna to make this episode just under an hour. We've got about 25 minutes left. So let's talk about Outlook. And, you know, what would you consider, Ryan, to be, you know, a, an indicator that you're on the right track and that you've, let's say, you know, made it as a content creator? What are some things, or do you have any questions for me about how that looks or, you know, what are your early goals with content and um, anything I can, I can tell you or, or uh, any questions you have about that? Yeah, I think the, well, when you ask me what I, how I define success, I, I mean, I'm not there yet. We'll, we'll get there in the future, I'm sure. But I want to go back to what you said about consistency. I think that that for me is, let me back up. There is, it's really easy to set a big goal in anything in life, really, like you, I don't know, you're going on a diet, you're trying to lose weight, you want to get to a certain weight that's kind of your target. It's really scary to approach trying to lose 40 pounds because you can't do it in one day. And so I think of like building a following, trying to start a new brand and build this thing up in the same way. Like, I'm not going to get there overnight. I'm not going to start an Instagram and, and have, you know, 100,000 followers the next day or something crazy like that. 
So it, I think it's kind of just celebrating the consistency from one day to the next has been the first thing. And to almost assign myself, this is your task for the day. You cannot let this day pass without making your post on Instagram, without doing this, this, and this thing, and kind of just holding yourself to a few of those absolutes. So I don't know if that's right or wrong, but it, it's at least helping continue to motivate me in the in the early days when you know you, you're putting in a lot more than you're getting out uh, when you're at the point that I'm at right now. But it's fun, and I think that with consistency and some endurance over time, that can really build up into something great. So that's kind of how I'm judging it, but. I guess I'd be curious on your take on that. Is that kind of how you would approach it when you're pretty early like I am still? Um, I, th I think not that Instagram followers are like the number one consideration, but I've, I've followed how many followers I've picked up and I'm something, I'm approaching 600. I think I'll probably cross that today. I started this account and started posting on it a little over two months ago. And, and it was actually on the two month anniversary of my first post that I hit 500 followers. So it feels kind of fast to get to that, but I know I'm like completely small potatoes compared to a lot of the folks out there still. So um, part one of my question for you, Jeremy, curious your thoughts on, is that the right approach? And I'm almost just curious to hear more about how, how did you feel about Sports Cards Live when you were in your early days? Like what were your early goals and when did you know it was gonna be a success longer term as it's kind of developed into? Great questions. Um, I hope my answers help you. Uh, so I first sort of, I didn't, I didn't go in with any goals, Ryan, my, my, my only, uh, my mission was to be consistent and my, and to continuously improve. I, again, going back to the beginning of our discussion, the hardest thing for content creators is just starting. Now it's harder for some than others. Some people are comfortable with it, but the hardest thing is just starting. So once you get that first episode under your belt, then can, now you've you've started. Now it comes down to consistency and and planning and always trying to be improving. Continuous improvement is something that I I always keep in mind for myself. I try to do it, and you know, even three and a half years into creating consistent content in the hobby, I'm always looking for ways to make it better. Add new themed shows like this one right here. You know, this one's brand new today, so. Uh, you know, I'm happy to sort of set that example and to show, you know, just, just start, don't worry about being perfect. You know, if I do 10 episodes of this podcast accelerator with 10 different up and coming content creators, I may look back at this one and think, well, this, that one wasn't the best one, but continuously improve. That's something as far as monitoring your Instagram followers, my, my the most important thing there is just be organic with it. As soon as there's, there are content creators out there who buy followers, they have fake followers and people sniff that out pretty quick. And I can tell you, there's a couple out there that I'm surprised that they bought followers. I'm almost surprised, almost disappointed that I can tell that they've bought followers. Now it, you know, it can it is what it is. Some people are going to do that to, to accelerate uh, their, their credibility, but I think it's a bad move. I think the better strategy, and I've never paid for a follower or even boosted a post or anything. It's all been organic. And I don't have a, I don't, I don't, I think I don't even, I don't know, even know if I have 7,000 followers on Instagram yet, but I'm okay with it because I prefer to have quality followers and subscribers and listeners than, than, a, you know, you, you want to watch your ratio, uh, like what's the what's the level of engagement on your posts versus the amount of followers you have. And people will sniff out if you have if you have 15,000 followers, but you're only getting 200 views on your on your reels. You obviously have a, a ton of fake followers and people will sniff that out. So be concerned with authentic, organic followers and and engagement. That's 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 the very, very, very important. And, you know. If you put out quality, consistent content, those followers will come. So it's almost like if you build it, they will come. And I think that's that's uh, that's really really important. There did that did that does that answer your question? Do you want to press me on anything else there? Yeah, well, I think that it, it definitely helps, and I'm in full agreement that I don't understand the purpose almost of buying followers because if the point is to build a real following, so you can maybe eventually monetize it or something down the road. Like, I don't think fake followers are going to 
you know, buy whatever you're selling down the road, right? So what's the purpose of that? And you're not helping anyone that way. So I, it's hard, I think, early because there's, I don't have a podcast launched quite yet, but it's like, what is the scorecard for progress? And that's the thing that I've kind of latched onto is, okay, yeah, I can look at book sales and stuff. But I, I also recognize that the book is, it's for a certain crowd. It's not necessarily for everyone you know, maybe don't buy it. Honestly, if you're, if you're like a more advanced collector, just, I, I think I'm probably a better follow on Instagram. If you know the card space super well and don't need help with the basic stuff. Um, but like, what would you use as a scorecard then if maybe not quality of follower uh, or quantity of follower? I know you mentioned engagement. Are there other things you would consider for almost like monitoring your own business's growth when you're in the early stages and it's harder to see the actual progress from one day to the next. Well, by business, if you just mean being a content creator, I think one thing that that was very critical to me early on to keep on going and to realize that I was making a difference was the the messages that I got from people, the comments that I got on my videos, the DMs I received. Uh, it was it, it was awesome. Like there were a lot of people saying, "Found your channel, love what you're doing, keep it up." You know, I'm listening to you as I'm driving to work. Like, it's kind of neat to know that people are listening to you when they're driving to work all around the world. I think my podcast reaches like 80 countries now. It's it's absolutely ridiculous. I think some of them are just, you know, Canadians and Americans are on vacation in some of these countries, but I'm okay with that. It's still, it's still pretty cool. So um, I, I think, uh, I think. That is a is one way to measure it is how many direct responses and replies are you getting? But of course, watching the uptick in subscribers on YouTube, watching the uptick on on um, I don't know if it's good, they're called subscribers or followers on on Spotify. Apple doesn't seem to give you that that information. How many views are your videos getting? How many downloads are your podcasts getting? And then the follower count. It is the follower count. I just don't think it's worth it to be so focused on your follower count. Let that just let it happen organically. Now, if you're creating content for three years and you don't, you're not seeing any new followers, then you might that take that as a sign to tweak your formula a little bit. Make a few, make a few changes. Um, really quickly, let's go to a couple of content uh, comments. Benjamin says, "Bingo, engagement matters more." Completely agree. Completely agree. Uh, John, join me tonight on Taking Stock to talk about uh, the five players that might be suspended, please. Uh, Eric says, I didn't realize people were still buying followers. That is the worst. Fully agree. I guarantee you there are. And you wouldn't. some you wouldn't even expect. I was very surprised when I found a couple. And I'm not out there looking, but I'm like, oh, this guy's got 15,000 followers. Uh, let, let's go see. And you're like, yeah, okay, that's why. That's why. John says, buying followers is probably a bigger business than online advertising at this point. Dev, same for paying for likes and comments. Yep, don't do not do that. The thing is, people will, will sniff that out, is what I believe. And then uh, Ben Diamond gives you some advice, Ryan. He says, I would consider following people back. You have 500 followers while only following 50 people back. You'll come off a bit more likable and down to earth, in my opinion. So that's something to consider right there as well, is follow people back. And, uh, you know, especially if you want to add the human element by putting yourself out there. I think that's good advice from Ben. Um, okay. You want to, you want to kind of move on to the next, uh, the next topic that we can discuss or do you have any follow-up? No, I think that's great. That's really helpful. Um, I think biggest takeaway for me is, I mean, like follower count, it's just a number. So it's easy to grasp onto that, but you can look at your engagement stats too. And I think that the, to your point, I'm starting to get some of those DMS too. like, Hey, this is a great book or great, great post today you know, what do you think about this card and stuff? And it's like, great. I'm, I don't, I don't necessarily know everything, but I'm happy to give you a perspective on it. And it's, it's cool to just see the interaction with people. So, but yeah, let's move on to the next one. Um, you mind if I ask you just another question here? No, please go ahead. So I've got a lot of passion for this, but I think that anytime you start something new, it's, you know, the people in your life are going to say, yeah, go, go get them, buddy. Like, you know, they're going to be supportive. They're not necessarily going to care about it the way that you do though. And I'm finding that that's very true here when I'm trying to get a brand off the ground, really excited about it, thinking about it all day long, working on it multiple hours per day. 
my wife is very supportive, of course, but even like my card buddies that I, you know, would, would say, Hey, what do you think about this card or whatever? Everyone's got those guys in the hobby, but those folks are sick of me. I'm pretty sure. And I don't blame them. I would, I would probably want to punch me in the head too, for like the, the 18th time that I've asked them like, Hey, what do you think about this or that for my, like this brand thing that I'm trying to put out there? It's kind of a lonely road, I guess. I don't know how else to say it. What do you think about that? Have you experienced this or did your show take off fast enough that you didn't necessarily run into that in your early days? Well, so for me, early on when I first started Sports Cards Live, I would go live on Saturday night and the show would be over and I would still be just buzzing with excitement because I had so much fun doing the show and and I had great feedback from people. And then I'd, I'd be sitting here by myself, you know, you go from all this action and like, you know, running a live show, it, there's, there's a lot of moving parts when you're doing it. And I'd be, I'd, I'd end it and I'd, okay, well now what do I do? I'm kind of, oh, you know, that was fun. I just had, I just had, you know, 60 people watching and a guest to talk to and, and a bunch of people engaging in the chat. And now here I am by myself all of a sudden, it was kind of like from, from, from light to dark all of a sudden. And so, I was fortunate to have a couple of hobby friends and, and other content creators that I would actually get on the phone with and just talk about and get feedback from them. You know, they would, and they would give me critical feedback. Like, like here's what you did well, and here's what you could do better. And I seeked that out. Cause I, again, coming back to continuous improvement, something that I try to keep top of mind all the time. So I think, you know, and then, and, and then what this leads me to, to think about is, you know, I follow and I listen to and I'm friends with uh, Rob Gerard, the sports card therapist who's built out. I think he was going through something similar and he built out what he calls his wolf pack, which is just his group of his inner core group of fellow content creator buddies that he can talk to and bounce ideas off of. I think building yourself that small it doesn't have to be small, but that community of fellow content creator friends that that, you know, that like what you're doing and that you like what they're doing and that, you know, it's a two way relationship. You can give them advice, critique, and they can give it back to you. It's, you know, we get as content creators, we get a lot of critique, but a lot, most of it is unsolicited, right? It's from people that, you know, you're, you're, you, that, that give it to you, but, and a lot, I'm talking about the negative stuff where they, you know, you might get uh, criticized or attacked or what have you. And that, that's just par for the course, right? You, you get used to that, but, but it's nice to have, a group of people, however many, it could be in one, two, three, four, five people that you can reach out to and say, you know what, I'm thinking this, I'm feeling that. What do you think? How, just like you're asking me right now, how do you deal with it? So I think that that's something that's that's really important to help alleviate that sort of loneliness. Uh, you know, and it's still, I started a late show just so that I wouldn't be, you know, lonely after my early show. And okay, I'm going to do a late show called After Hours. The 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 crowd wanted it, but it gave me more time to engage and just be excited. So I think that's, uh, you know, I'm not saying start a second podcast, but I'm saying <laughs> seek out like-minded people, engage with them. You know, you, you said you've received some messages from people, send out some messages, watch some content, send out some messages to people, ask questions, be humble, be humble, but also, uh, you know, be authentic in the way that you're approaching things. Does that make sense? Does that help you? Yeah, I think that's great. And I think it's it's going back to one of the things you said, it's it's being able to like reciprocate and give someone else feedback because I feel like I'm just taking, taking, taking from my like card buddies when I'm continuously asking them for feedback on my thing, but I they don't have their own brand or whatever. They're not doing that type of business. So it's not it's not an apples to apples where I can say, What are you working on? How can I help you? I feel so I'm I'm like feeling that internally like. I got to stop hitting up my guy here because he's going to, again, he's going to punch me in the head if I, if I don't stop asking him about this. So I think that it's a really good tip to just go and find some other folks that are trying to do similar things and, you know, just live within that group for, for that type of feedback. Cause I'm like you, I want all the critical feedback I can get so I can learn from it and, and, you know, better sharpen the type of stuff that I'm putting out there to hopefully hit the mark a little bit better for what people are looking for. Well, well, here's a little idea that just dawned on me. I mean, I've, I've lined up a few more people, I think, after they see this episode, we'll see if they still want to do it, but to come on for sub subsequent episodes of this podcast accelerator idea that you helped me conceive. And, you know, that might be a great group of people to make friends with and talk to every so often. And, you know, maybe we have a, 
we have a once a month Zoom call and we talk about, you know, best practices and experiences and and how to make sure that we are always being inspirational, educational, entertaining. We're delivering that information with passion, authenticity and expertise. If we're doing that, I mean, it can we, we can build a we can build your inner circle starting today. You know, it's it's an it's an option. But again, the more you interact with other people, other content creators, um, ask people for advice, be humble. You know, I think that's going to help you overcome that sort of concern or that sort of uh, challenge that you're that you're seeing right now for yourself. I want to thank you, John, for the Uncle Ben's uh, tips there. Sounds like something we should definitely uh, check out for sure. So thanks for that. Um, OK, uh, let's see. T-Rex just jumps on and says. So T Rex, uh, yeah, send send uh, send Ryan a, a direct message on Instagram with that question. It's just a little bit off topic for what we're doing here uh, today, and we're running short on time. So Ryan, any any uh, more questions? I'm kind of looking at, at our outline. Um, anything else you'd like to talk about? Yeah, the one thing that I'm curious to hear your opinion on. When you touched a little bit about this. It's a it's a really it's a tough topic because I feel like. Um, it's hard to get behind the curtain and really see how to do this. You hear different ways, but when it comes to monetization, how would you approach this? And and I, I guess when I think about this, the way that I, I have always approached my brand so far is I believe that if I put great content out there that provides people with value, I'll start to attract some kind of an audience. If I continue to do that and continue to, to entertain and provide educational good stuff that people want to see, they'll follow me or they'll continue to, to tune in or to read, to, to listen when I get the podcast rolling, whatever it may be. But I'm also interested at some point in time and if I can put out enough value to earn the right to do this at a higher level and and like replace my full time day job income and do this at a, as like a full time thing. That sounds very appealing to me. So I'm curious your thoughts on when is it the right time to to at least start thinking about how to monetize something like this? Yeah, that you're right. This is a challenging thing if that is among your goals. So, I mean, from my my experience and my journey, when I started, I wasn't thinking about monetizing at all. I was just thinking about having fun during the pandemic. And so that allowed me to, to be authentic and passionate. And I come from over 40 years in the hobby. So I knew I had the subject matter expertise. Uh, I didn't know if I'd be in and I didn't know if I would be entertaining or inspiring, but I wasn't even thinking about that. I just wanted to get out there and have some fun and uh, and just do it. And, and, and so I did. So I think you have to have that mindset of just being authentic and trying to provide value. I don't, I, if you go into it looking to make money, I don't think that's the right approach. I think you have to look at it to provide value, educate, inspire, entertain. If you're doing that, you will build your audience. Your content is worthless from a monetization perspective if you're not reaching anybody. You're only going to reach people if they like you. So you have to be those things educate, inspire, entertain, all these things. You have to do that first. Build out your content. And now you're in a position where you have a following. You have to also have a niche, which you do. You have a niche. You have something very specific. And that's that's a wonderful thing. Then you can then you can attract sponsors. There are channels that look at the sports card dad, Dustin Cooley. He's got several sponsors now and he puts out a daily video every morning, you know, and it's it's it's, it's, enter he's entertaining. He's passionate. You know, I, I don't know how, how many people he inspires. I'll let his, his, his com the commenters on his videos tell us that. But I think if you, if you go into it to provide value, then you can start thinking about, about the monetization. But I would look at that down the road. Now you can keep it in the back of your mind, knowing that you have to be this, these authentic, passionate. The, uh, another thing is that, you never know when you might happen upon an idea that can be monetized. And a personal example, two and a half years ago, I, I was already doing sports cards live for almost a year. And I thought to myself, you know, I'm going to go watch all these auctions end on eBay downstairs in my office, which is right here. I'm going to sit here and watch auctions end because it's a lot of cool uh, auctions on PWCC's hockey night for the month. 
I said, well, why don't I just stream myself? I'll share my screen and we'll do it together. And I did. And it was very well received. And people said, oh, I hope you do it again next time. So I did it again next time. I did not go into that with the plans of making money. But here we are two plus years later, and I turned it into a legitimate business where I'm offering those services now to seven different companies in our space. I had no vision, Ryan, when I when I came down into my office that night that this would be monetized. It was completely authentic. It was completely organic and something I'm very proud of today. It's pretty darn cool that I was able to do that. Now, I feel like there are several other opportunities out there for people to do things. I don't like that. When I say like that, I don't mean do live auction coverage. I mean, whatever it may be. So it really comes back to just wanting to provide. And like that to me was like, this will be fun. I'll go live, watch these auctions end, and I'll have fun with the viewers. And it and it was, it was fun. So I think from a monetization perspective, don't make it your number one goal. You, it's, I don't see that being a recipe for success. Your number one goal has to be to, to provide value, entertainment, inspiration, education. If you're doing that, I think that the, the money will maybe come, but don't make that your number one goal uh, or do and see what happens, but that would not be my advice. Before you respond, gather your thoughts for a moment and I'm going to go to a couple comments while you do gather them. Thank you, John, for being here. Loud Collector Phil says, even if the content is poopy, I have the utmost respect for putting themselves out there consistently. That's a great sign for you, Ryan, right there. John says, you want people to relate to you? Seducing a crowd is like seducing a woman at the bar. Uh, be authentic. Be passionate, right? People like that. Women, men, everyone likes that. Ben Diamond says, I think coming from a place as an authority only works if you have a resume to back it up. I would consider putting your wins front and center, pinned, i.e. your total money made. I think there's something to that. Uh, you know, and, you know, we talk about being an authority. I said to Ryan privately, I said, you've, ri you've written the book. That There's kind of credibility built into the fact that you have a book professionally produced. Like that right there, I think, gives you some credibility. But I do like Ben's comment. Maybe you have some stats that you pin up or you have in your bio or something like that. He goes on to say, so many make more money selling picks than following them. Yeah, I am not a fan of selling picks, Ryan. If that's the direction you end up going after today, all the power to you. I wish I wish you the best, but I won't be subscribed because I I want to I want to appeal to people's true passion not to them just oh go buy this player to make some money so um and i don't think that's what your book is doing your book isn't giving it's not giving tips on what players to buy it's more or less giving tips on how to decide for yourself what to buy and who to who to invest in from a card perspective if you could add some collecting content to your to your platform i think that would resonate well as well cuz let's face it and i say this a lot collectors here, investors here, you know, I don't know if anyone's on the extreme edges. So everywhere, everyone is, or most people are somewhere in between that. So you can be an investor, a collector, a flipper all at the same time. I believe John says, Jeremy's pure kid-like passion for the hobby is why I listen. Thanks, John. I appreciate that. Um, I do feel like a kid when it comes to all this. I'm going to come back to you and ask Brian, any comments? Does that, did that help? Yeah, definitely. And I, I like Benjamin Diamond, the call out in the comments is great. Um, and that's exactly why I'm doing what I'm doing there. I, I agree with you completely. There are so many people that are trying to monetize. Here's my picks. And then you're stuck continuing to buy those picks week after week after week. It's like give a man a fish, you know, feed him for a day, teach a man to fish, feed him for a lifetime, right? So I'm trying to teach people how to do this or how to think about it. And again, my approach isn't the only one, but I'm at least trying to lay the foundation for folks that don't have any background as to here's what's worked for me so that they don't have to rely on those folks that are trying to sell picks because that sucks. Like, no, <laughs> and also, I don't know anyone that has like a hundred percent win rate either. So, you know, you're, you're buying something that is still risky at the end of the day, regardless. So I'm just trying to get to how can I help people make their own decisions? And if I can do that for one person out there, great. It's a win. Um, other thing that I, I love that you said, Jeremy, is just leading with value. And I think that that's kind of the approach I've taken. So 
I ask the monetization question because it's it's kind of a touchy subject almost. It, you know, it's hard to to really see how content creators do that do make money how they did that. And I, I'm so far like I have a book, of course, so you can buy that. But honestly, don't buy it if it's not for you. It's <laughs> like if you're a more advanced collector, I don't care. Like if you don't buy my book, I'd I'd rather you like engage with me on Instagram and be part of the conversation because I think you're right that that's where the majority of the value is can come from like where when you can really engage with folks and and like have more dialogue back and forth um but yeah just leading with value above all else i think is something that i've kind of set my clock to so to speak and something that i at least for now i'm intending to continue doing but was curious to hear your thoughts on you know eventually if, if there's enough value money follows i think that's kind of the best approach the way that you've um kind that's of stated it here so I think that's the only approach. If you go the other direction, you know, money first and product or quality of product later, uh, I think you're just setting yourself up for attack. There's a there's a there's a lot right. of people in a, in the hobby space who you know are just waiting for the next person to pick on. So you know, don't 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 make yourself a target if you don't have to. Uh, thank you, Ben Diamond, for clarifying. Didn't think you were saying that anyway, but do appreciate that. But the, Ben makes a good point here. I want to see why I should listen to someone or consume their content within five to 10 seconds. And so, you know, that's, that is what we're dealing with in the, in the hobby content space and really in society today are these short attention spans and the, and I'm, I'm kind of the same way. I'll turn on a, a YouTube video or a podcast. And if I'm not kind of drawn in, in that first, maybe 30 seconds, I might just go on to the next thing. So, all right, we are at, uh, we are just about at the hour mark and uh, my wife is about to go on a business call that's going to drain my Wi-Fi or my, 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 my internet power. So we, need, we do need to wrap up, Ryan. Any final comments or questions from yourself? The chat, throw them in there if you can. And then I'm gonna have a final question for Ryan, but I'm gonna put it back to you, Ryan, because I wanna provide as much value to you as I can here today. Yeah, I appreciate that. Um, I'm, I've got like four other things I'm trying to prioritize. Maybe combine a couple of these into one, but. Let's do rapid when you're fire. Thinking, yeah, well, okay, so let's do that. So um, platforms, is it better to be very good at one thing, like a podcast or like Instagram and just like kind of master that thing and just be a beast on that? Or do you think that it's important to be on multiple different platforms so you can reach a wider audience? Multiple platforms, certain platforms complement each other. And then you can also use platforms to just advertise and promote that you're going live or that you have this going on next week or drop just drop the podcast. If you can do a podcast, you want to be on Instagram so that Iowa Dave can tag you on his daily podcast updates of who's dropping content. Follow Iowa Dave on Instagram, everybody, if you're not yet. Great guy, great podcast and doing a great service for the hobby. Instagram compliments your podcast. Instagram compliments YouTube. Twitter can do the same thing. I'm not very active on Twitter. TikTok. If you're going to do, if you're going to do long form like I do, then you might you might want to have somebody or do it yourself. Edit into short form and upload those to YouTube Reels to to uh, or YouTube Shorts, Instagram Reels, and you can also put them up on on in, on Twitter as well. And then there's TikTok. TikTok's a whole other beast that you can just multi-purpose these short reels and put them up on three or four different uh, platforms at a time. So consider that they complement each other, and you know. The greatest, the greatest like content creators out there will tell you, hit them all, hit all the platforms. That's going to be up to you. There's only so many hours in the day, but if you're going to prioritize for the hobby, I would say Instagram, uh, YouTube, and podcast. I, I, TikTok and Twitter, important threads now, but not as, in my opinion. Um, and then... Uh, the other thing is that when you do like this, for example, what we're doing right now, when this is over, I'm going to download the audio and I'm going to push it up to the podcast platform. It takes less than 10 minutes. There we go. All of a sudden, this is on Spotify and Apple. What we're doing today. It's an amazing, it's just so convenient and easy. Next question. Love it. Kill two birds with one stone or three in this case, it sounds like. Okay. So, uh, I think the focus was another piece of this is there's so many things you can do how do you focus on or what kind of guides you is it does it always come back to delivering high value and your six you know piece mantra or like what what do you do to make sure that you're focused on the right things when you're kind of a one man show what would i what would i want to watch and listen to what would entertain me what am i excited about if i'm excited about something i take it for granted that some other people will be and those people will find me somehow 
again, when I come up with a new idea for content, I have a built-in audience already. I have that, I have that advantage. So I can I can test market things like this here right now. If we didn't have we got 25 people with us right now, Ryan. We didn't even announce this was happening. We'd have zero if I didn't have an established channel and subscriber base. So I don't take that for granted that I have it, but I also, I, I have that advantage right now. So um, I think if you are, if, if you produce content that you find interesting, that you would watch, I think you're going to be good. I, th I think you're going to be fine. Don't manufacture something that there's no need for as well. Look out, look out into the landscape and think, you know, are there, pe is this a, in the hobby space? Would people want to consume this type of content? Now it's been, I've, I've also, it's different for me. I do interviews on Saturday nights. That's my flagship show is sports cards live. And then I have all these other things that I'm doing that surround it. But I always come back to sports cards live as the thing that, that created my, my platform and is where I'm consistent. And I just, I interview people. And they're not all as in, not everyone is as interesting as everybody else, but that's kind of, you know, I, I have, I have that formula, develop a formula for yourself, stick. I want to say stick to it, but, but let the boundaries be flexible, experiment with things. I've experimented. If you go back into my YouTube channel, you'll see ideas I abandoned pretty quick because I just, I wasn't excited about it. If I'm not excited about it, I don't want to do it. So th does that help you? Yeah, I love it. And it, I feel like I'm doing some of that already where I'm trying to put myself back into my own shoes 16 years ago when I started looking at how do you make money with sports cards? What were the questions that I had that I would want to know the answers to? And that's kind of been my guiding, you know, um, my compass, I suppose, for what to try to put out there. And the things that I'm trying to, to put out there are also things that I do. So going back to like just general authenticity, it's nothing that I wouldn't do myself, I guess. It, I would never advise someone to do something that I'm not actively doing for my own card venture and collecting purposes. So I um, oh, yeah. love that answer. I think it, it, if you're going to talk the talk, you got to walk the walk. You have to be. And that comes back right. to being authentic. Again, one of my main ingredients for success in content is you have to be authentic and people will sniff it out if you aren't. So um, thank you. Yeah, Eric says, Sports Cards Live is my anchor. And 100%. I 100% agree with that. Without that, I have I have no other content. Anything, any other questions? That's great. Um, I'm just curious, like, what kind of content for you has, has generated the most reaction, the best response from your audience? Like, what are you most proud of? Just the, the stuff that you've built over the years here. I gotta say, like, uh, I'm I'm very proud that I kind of pioneered this niche of auction coverage that I've then monetized and turned into a a legitimate like marketing service I provide to auction companies, consignment companies. I'm very proud of that, and I love doing it, and I've got great relationships there. But uh, you know, I don't. That doesn't happen if I haven't done other things before that to elevate my brand. And really, it's been the ability to bring on great guests for my interviews and get and and be recognized as a good interviewer. I had no interview experience, zero. I went live one day and here we are, you know, and, and I, you know, we're coming up on 200 uh, episodes of, of that anchor show, Sports Cards Live. I'm well over 430 or 40 total live streams now. But that's what I'm proud of is being consistent and, you know, getting messages from people that they enjoy what I'm doing a lot, like constant, consistently, I should say. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's, uh, I, I think, I, th I think, can you repeat the question though? I feel like I've, I've, uh, I'm, I'm veering off here. <laughs> no, I think you, you kind of hit on it, but what kind of content or what like has sports cards live done that you are most proud of, or that has like yeah. maybe received the best reaction from your, your, your audience? Bringing guests who can enlighten the hobby the audience the, that is the hobby bringing on guests that that's my main content is our interviews so bringing on great guests that's really what it is that people want to hear from you know the on saturday night i had the the new management team from the national those guys chose my platform as where they wanted to be i you know they they chose i i didn't choose now we talked about it and i you know followed up but they chose Sports Cards Live. And so I got to be proud of that. I mean, they didn't choose anyone else. 
That's, they, they chose me and my brand and my platform. And uh, I'm very, very proud and grateful for that. And humbled. I mean, you know, it, 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 it's, it's, I can't believe it. I can't believe it, to be honest. I've had Dr. Beckett on my show five times and he's coming. We just scheduled him again. It's been too long. Dr. Beckett, I mean, come on. Like he, the godfather of the hobby. I, I couldn't be prouder that that he, yeah, to call him a friend and a, and, a, and an advisor, a mentor. Um, so yeah, but you know, you're going to carve out your own path, your own style of content. And that's going to bring me to what I think is, unless you have any more questions, cause we should wrap up. My final question for, for you is how have you enjoyed this last hour on the, on the sports cards live podcast accelerator <laughs> episode number one. And are you feeling like you are ready to start your next, your, your next chapter of content? This has been unbelievably helpful. I think that it's almost funny what I'm trying to do for a beginner in the sports card world is what you're doing for me right now. You're pulling back the curtain and like giving me all the tips and secrets. And frankly, what hearing you say what not to do is almost more valuable than, you know, making suggestions for maybe what I should do. Um, would love to avoid, you know, pitfalls along the way, of course. But no, this has been outstanding. And I guess this is... In this bag here, I have just ordered a Blue Yeti mic so I can set up and get my podcast going. That's what with. I use. We're gonna let it. We're gonna let it go and and see what happens. Um, but I, I do love your mantra of just do it. Like just what's the worst thing that happens? It's probably either gonna turn out great or it's gonna turn into a really funny story about how it failed so miserably, and, and I can learn from it and move on, you know, in a different way, and that's fine too. So. And exactly. That's okay too. Don't be afraid to fail. Like this is fun. Make it fun. Follow my, my, my six core ingredients of content success. Keep them in mind. At least add your own, come up with your own recipe for, for content, your formula for the, for the, for the subject matter itself. And um, Ryan, I just want to say, Hey, thank you for helping me uh, conceive of this idea to do this show that I, I owe this. I owe if, if the, Sports Cards Live Podcast Accelerator continues past episode one. I have you to thank for helping me come up with this idea. Legit, like, thank you so much. I, this has been fun for me as well. I want to help more people. I want to help bring quality content into our space. There's a lot of quality content already. There's room for more. There's a lot of not so quality content out there. So let's provide some, some, some more options for the hobby. Let's help grow the hobby and make the hobby a happy place for more and more people or a happy place, just a place where people enjoy spending their time. So uh, with that, and and I do have a few other people lined up. So everyone who's watching, hey guys, thanks for coming out here on a, on a Tuesday afternoon unannounced. And um, we'll see when the next version or episode of the podcast accelerator here on Sports Cards Live is going to happen. And um, yeah, thanks everybody for following my journey, being along for it. And hopefully you, you will follow Ryan on Instagram and uh, watch there because that's where Ryan will eventually announce that he's doing more content, uh, whether it's a podcast or YouTube videos or so and so forth. So you good to end this? Good to end it. Appreciate it, man. Thanks for having me on here. It's been a lot of fun. Yeah, you're welcome, Ryan. Thank you for joining. Thanks again to everybody in the chat for being here. And with that, this episode of the Sports Cards Live Podcast Accelerator is now